inside june by zona gale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reading by matt perard inside june by zona gale the difficulty with a june day is that you never can get near enough to it this month comes within few houses and if you want it you must go out to it when you are within doors knowing that out of doors it is june the urge to be out there with it is resistless but though you wade in green steep in sun breast wind and glory in them all still the day itself eludes you it would seem in june that there should be a specific for the malady of being oneself so that one might get to be a june day outright however if one were oneself more and more might not one finally become a june day or something of this sort i am quoting as nearly as may be from the book of our youth your youth and mine always the book of youth will open at a page like this and occasionally it is as if we turned back and read there and made a path right away through the page this morning a rose-breasted grosbeak wakened me singing on a bough of box elder so close to my window that the splash of rose on his throat almost startled me it was as if i ought not to have been looking and to turn away from out of doors was like leaving someone who was saying something but as soon as i stepped into the day i perceived my old problem the difficulty with the june day is that you can never get near enough i stood for a little at the front gate trying soberly to solve the matter or i stood where the front gate should have been for in our midland american villages we have few fences or hedges and alas no stone walls though undoubtedly this lack comes from an insufficient regard for privacy yet this negative factor i am inclined to condone for the sake of the positive motive and this i conceive to be that we are wistful of more ample occupation than is commonly contrived by our fifty feet village lots and so we royally add to our yards the sidewalk and the planting space and the road and as much of our neighbor's lawn as our imagination can annex there seems to me to be in this a certain charming pathos as it were a survival in us of the time when we had only to name broad lands our own and to stay upon them in order to make them ours in very fact and now it is as if this serene pushing back of imaginary borders were in reality an appending a kind of spiritual taking up of a claim how do i get nearer to june i admit that it is a question of the veriest idler but what a delightful company of these questions one can assemble as how to find one's way to a place that is the way it seems a way across a meadow how to meet enough people who hear what one says in just the way that one means it how to get back at will those fugitive moments when one almost knows what it is all about and with this question the field of the idler becomes the field of the wise man and indeed if one idles properly or rather if the proper person idles the two fields are not always on opposite sides of the road to idle is by no means merely to do nothing it is an avocation a calling away nay one should say a piping away to idle is to inhibit the body and to let the spirit keep on not every one can idle i know estimable people who frequently relax like chickens in the sun but i know only a few who use relaxation as a threshold and not as a goal and who idle until the hour yields its full blessing i wonder if to idle at adventure might not be the way to june so i went out on the six o'clock street in somewhat the spirit in which another might ride the greenwood 
almost immediately i had an encounter for i came on my neighbor in her garden not my neighbor who lives on the other side of me and who is a big and obvious deacon with a family of a great many light gowns but my neighbor she was watering her garden these water rules and regulations of the village are among its spells to look at the members of the water commission one would never suspect them of romance but if they have it not why have they named from five until nine o'clock the only morning hours when one may use the city water for one's lawn and garden i insist that it cannot be a mere regard for the municipal resources and that the commissioners must see something of the romance of getting up before five o'clock to drench one's garden and are providing for the special educational value of such a custom or if i do not believe this i wish very much that i did with the proper grounds to tell the truth however i do not credit even my neighbor with feeling the romance of the hour and of her occupation she is a still woman of more than forty who does not feel a difference between her flower and her vegetable gardens but regards them both as a part of her life in the kind of car-window indifference and complacency of certain travellers she raises foxgloves and parsley and the sun shines over all i must note a strange impression which my neighbour gives me she has always for me an air of personal impermanence i have the fancy amounting to a sensation that she is where she is for just a moment and that she must rush back and be at it again i do not know at what but whether i see her in church or at a festival i have always all i can do to resist saying to her how did you get away it was so that she was watering her flowers as if she were intending at any moment to hurry off to get breakfast or put up the hammock or mend and yet before she did so she told me who was a willing listener a motion or two of the spirit of the village there is i observe a nicety of etiquette here about the not quite news not quite gossip shared with strangers and semi-strangers the rules seem to be strangers shall be told only the pleasant occurrences and conditions half strangers may discuss the unpleasant matters which they themselves have somehow heard but only pleasant matters may be added by accretion the rest of society may say whatever it has a mind but this mind as i believe is not harsh since nobody ever gossips except to people who gossip back miss toplady told me last night that calliope marsh is coming home for the java entertainment next week my neighbor imparted first and this was the best news that she could have given me it has been a great regret to me that this summer calliope is not in the village she has gone to the city to nurse some distant kinswoman more lonely than she and until ill health came long forgetful of calliope but she is to come back now and again to this and to that for the village interests are all her own i have never known any one in whom the tribal sense is so persistently alive as in calliope i asked my neighbor what this java entertainment would be which was to give back calliope and she looked her amazement that i did not know it would be it appeared one of those great fairs which the missionary society is always projecting and carrying magnificently forward it's awful feet aching work said my neighbor reflectively but honestly calliope seems to like it i don't know but i do too the sodality meant to have one when they set out to pave daphne street but it turned out it wasn't needed well big affairs like that makes it seem as if we'd been born into the whole world and not just into friendship village my neighbor told me that a new public library had been opened in a corner of the post office store and that a great crowd was drawing books though for this she herself cannot vouch since the library is only open saturday evenings and saturday she says with decision 
is a bad night it is in fact i note very difficult to find a free night in the village save only tuesday monday because of its obvious duties and incident fatigue is as impossible as sunday wednesday is club day thursday is prayer meeting friday is sacred to church suppers and entertainments and the ladies aid society and saturday is invariably denominated a bad night and omitted without question we are remote from society but tuesday is literally our only free evening of course it won't be the same with you about books my neighbor admits you can send your girl down to get a book for you but i have to be home to get out the clean clothes how's your girl going to like the country she asked i am to have here in the village i find many a rebuke for habits of mine which lag behind my theories for though i try to solve my share of a tragic question by giving to my swedish maid elfa the self-respect and the privilege suited to a human being dependent on me together with ways of comfort and some leisure yet i find the homely customs of the place to have accomplished more than my careful system and though when i took her from town i scrupulously added to the earnings of my little maid i confess that it had not occurred to me to wonder whether or not she would like friendship village we seem so weary far from the conditions which we so facilely conceive especially i seem far i am afraid that i engaged elfa in the first place with less attention to her economic fitness than that she is so trim and still and wistful with such a peculiarly winning upward look and that her name is elfa i told my neighbor that i did not know yet whether elfa would like it here or not and for refuge i found fault with the worms on the rose bushes also i made a note in my head to ask elfa how she likes the country but the spirit of a thing is flown when you make a note of it in your head how does elfa like the town for that matter i never have asked her this either she'll be getting married on your hands anyway my neighbor observed the ladies here say that's one trouble with trying to keep a hired girl they will get married but i say let them at least here is a matter in which my theory like that of my neighbors outruns those of certain folk of both town and village for i myself have heard women complain of their servants marrying and establishing families and deplore this short-sightedness in not staying where there is a good home a nice room plenty to eat and all the flat pieces sent to the laundry speaking of books said my neighbor have you seen nicholas moore i see almost no new books i told her guiltily me either she said i don't mean he's a book he's a boy nicholas moore that does a little writing himself i guess you will see him he'll be bringing some of his writing up to show you he took some to the new school principal i heard and to the invalid that was here from the city he seems to be sort of lonesome though he has got a good position he's interested in celluloid and he rings the catholic bell nicholas must be near thirty but he hasn't even showed any signs signs i hazarded of being in love she says simply and i have pondered pleasantly on this significant ellipsis of hers which takes serenely for granted the basic business of the world her elation reminds me of the delicate animism of the japanese which says when the rice pot speaks with a human voice then the demon's name is kanjo one can appraise a race or an individual by the class of things which speech takes for granted love or a demon or whatever it be and apropos of showing signs do i remember leva bessie and timothy toplady jr i am forced to confess that i remember neither i recall to be sure that the top ladies had a son but i had thought of him as a kind of qualifying clause and it is difficult to conceive of him as the subject of a new sentence when i hear of leva bessie 
i get her confused with a pink gingham apron and a pail of buttermilk which used sometimes to pass my house with leva combined fancy that pink gingham and that pail becoming a person and my neighbor tells me that the qualifying clause and the pink gingham are keeping company and perhaps are to determine the cut of indeterminate clauses and aprons world without end the young folks will couple off says my neighbor and she adds in a manner of spontaneous impression i think it's nice and it's nice for the whole family too i've seen families that wouldn't ever have looked at each other come to be real friends and able to see the angels in each other just by the young folks pairing off this whole town's married criss-cross and kittering family into family i like it it kind o of binds the soil my neighbor told me of other matters current in the village pleasant commonplaces having for her the living spirit which the commonplace holds in hostage i'm breathing little child soberly announced to me that first day of our acquaintance and i wonder why i smile my neighbor slowly crossed her garden and i followed on the walk these informal colloquies of no mean length are perfectly usual in the village and they do not carry the necessity for an invitation within the house or the implication of a call the relations of hostess and guest seem simply to be suspended and we talk with the freedom of spirits met in air is this not in its way prophetic of the time when we shall meet burdened of no conventions or upholstery or perhaps even words and there talk with the very freedom of villagers meanwhile i am content with conventions and passive amid upholstery but i do catch myself looking forward suddenly my neighbor turned to me with such a startled inquiring manner that i sent my attention out as at an alarm to see what she meant and then i heard what i had not before noted a thin wavering line of singing that had begun in the street beyond our houses and now floated inconsequently to us lifting dipping wandering i could even hear the absurd words my mary and mary what you mean i never know you don't make me merry very but you make me sorry oh the oh prolonged undulatory exploring the air to say something was like interrupting my neighbor's expression so i waited and it's old carrie she explained briefly when he does that it's like something hurts you ain't it i thought that this would be no one of my acquaintance and i said so but tentatively lest i should be forgetting some inherent figure of the village he's come here in the year she explained and save about the obvious import of old carrie's maudlin song she maintained that fine tribal reticence of hers except for the drinking she even said he seems to be a quiet nice man but it's a shame for peter's sake peter carey she added like a challenge is the brainiest young man in this town say what you want on which she told me something of this young superintendent of the cannon battery who has tried it in nebraska and could not bear to leave his father here this way and has just returned he works hard and plays the violin and is making a man of himself generally she told me don't miss him and i have promised that i will try not to miss peter carey they live out towards the cemetery way she added him and his father all alone peter will be along by here in a minute on his way to work it's most quarter too i set my husband down to his breakfast and got up his lunch before i come out i don't have my breakfast till the men folks get out of the way i never cease to marvel at these splendid capabilities which prepare breakfasts put up lunches turn the attention to the garden and all so to speak with the left hand ready at any moment to enter upon the real business of life to minister to the sick or bury the dead or conduct a town meeting or church supper or a birth they have a kind of goddess-like competence these women at any of these offices they arrive 
lacking the cloud it is true but magnificently equipped to settle the occasion in crises of say deafness they will clap a hot pancake on a friend's ear with an esculapian savoir faire for their efficiencies combine those of lost generations with all that they hear of in this in an open-minded eclecticism with puritans and foresters and courtiers in our blood who knows but that we have too the lingering ichor of gods and goddesses oh don't you wish you had what a charming peculiarity it would be to be descended from a state of immortality as well as to be preparing for it nay even now to be entered upon it in a few moments after that piteous fuddled song had died away on the other street peter carey came by my neighbor's house he was a splendid muscular figure in a neutral belted shirt and a hat battered quite to college exactions though i am sure that peter did not know that i could well believe that he was making a man of himself i have temerity to say that this boy superintendent of a canning factory looked as in another milieu shelley might have looked but so it was it was not the first time that i have seen in such an one the look the eyes with the vision and the shadow i have seen it in the face of a man who stood on a step-ladder papering a wall i have seen it in a mason who looked up from the foundation that he mortared i have seen it often and often in the faces of men who tilled the soil i was not surprised to know that peter carey took on the violin the violin is a way out for that look in one's eyes as for nicholas moore i have no doubt is the ringing of the catholic bell and i am not prepared to say that celluloid and wallpaper and mortar and meadows and canneries run under good conditions may not be a way out as well at all events the look was still in peter's face peter glanced briefly at my neighbor running the risk of finding us both looking at him realized the worst blushed a man's brown blush and nodded and smiled after he had looked away from us you see this grass said my neighbor peter keeps it cut my husband don't get home till so late we're awfully fond of peter there is no more tender eulogy and i would rather have that said of me in the village than in any place i know no grace of manner or dress or mind can deceive anybody they are fond of you or they are not and i would trust their reasons for either my neighbor's husband came out the front door at that moment and he and peter without greeting went on together her husband did not look toward us because in the village it seems not to be a husband and wife ceremonial to say good-bye in the morning i often fall wondering how it is in other places is it possible that men in general go away to work without the consciousness of family of themselves as going forth on the common quest is it possible that women see them go and are so unaware of the wonder of material life that they do not instance it in at least good-bye one would think that even the female bear in the back of the cave must growl out something simple when her lord leaves her in the hope of a good kill and when the two men had turned down the brick walk the maple leaves making a come and go of shadows and sun patterns on their backs my neighbor looked at me with a smile or say with two-thirds of a smile as if her vote to smile were unanimous but she were unwilling by it to impart too much it's all miggy with peter she said as if she were mentioning a symptom miggy i said with interest and found myself nodding to this new relationship as to a new acquaintance and i was once more struck with the precision with which certain simple people and nearly all great people discard the particularities and lay bare their truths could any amount of elegant phrasing so reach the heart of the thing and show it beating as did it's all miggy with peter yes my neighbor told me it's been her with him ever since he come here 
assuredly i thought the better of mickey for this and is it all peter with mickey i inquired with some eagerness land knows my neighbor thought and handed me the hose to hold while she turned off the water at the hydrant i remember that a young robin tried to alight on the curving spray just as the water failed and drooped i'd like to get a joke on a robin that way said my neighbor and laughed out in a kind of pleasant fellowship with jokes in general and especially with robins it made maggie's little sister laugh so the other day when that happened she added then she glanced over at me with a look in her face that i have not seen there before land she said this is the time of day after my husband goes off in the morning when i wish i had a little young thing running round now almost more than at night well i don't know both times i nodded without saying anything my eyes on the golden robin prospecting vainly among the green mulberries i wish that i were of those who know what to say when a door is open like this to some shut place well said my neighbor now i'll bake up the rest of the batter want a paint thus tacitly excused how true her instinct was courteously to put the three fringed pinks in my hand to palliate her leaving i have come back to my house and my own breakfast elfa said i first thing do you think you are going to like the country my little maid turned to me with her winning upward look no one she shocked me by saying and there was another door opened into another shut place and i did not know what to say to that either but i am near to my neighbor and in a manner to which elfa's trimness and wistfulness never have impressed me near to elfa herself and i am near near to the village as i left the outdoors just now all the street was alive with men and girls going to work women opening windows a wagon or two in from a caledonia farm a general universal not to say cosmic air of activity and coffee all the little houses set close together up and down the street were like a friendly porch party on a long narrow veranda where folks sit knee to knee with an avenue between for the ice cream to be handed all the little lawns and gardens were disposed like soft green skirts delicately embroidered fragrant flowing as i looked it seemed to me that i could hear the faint hum of the village talk in every house the intimate revealing confidences of the family quick with hope or anxiety or humor or passion animated by its common need to live and along the street flooded the sun akin to the morning quickening in many a heart the day has become charged for me with something besides daylight something which no less than daylight pervades illumines comes to meet me at a thousand points i wonder if it can be that unaware i did get near to june end of inside june by zona gale the lion's daughter by khalil gibran this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Ferrari. the lion's daughter by khalil gibran four slaves stood fanning an old queen who was asleep upon her throne and she was snoring and upon the queen's lap a cat lay purring and gazing lazily at the slaves the first slave spoke and said how ugly this old woman is in her sleep see her mouth droop and she breathes as if the devil were choking her then the cat said purring not half so ugly in her sleep as you in your waking slavery and the second slave said you would think sleep would smooth her wrinkles instead of deepening them she must be dreaming of something evil and the cat heard would that you might sleep also and dream of your freedom and the third slave said 
perhaps she is seeing the procession of all those that she has slain and the cat purred ay she sees the procession of your forefathers and your descendants and the fourth slave said it is all very well to talk about her but it does not make me less weary of standing and fanning and the cat purred you shall be fanning to all eternity for as it is on earth so it is in heaven at this moment the old queen nodded in her sleep and her crown fell to the floor and one of the slaves said that is a bad omen and the cat purred the bad omen of one is the good omen of another and the second slave said what if she should wake and find her crown fallen she would surely slay us and the cat purred daily from your birth she has slain you and you know it not and the third slave said yes she would slay us and she would call it making sacrifice to the gods and the cat purred only the weak are sacrificed to the gods and the fourth slave silenced the others and softly he picked up the crown and replaced it without waking her on the old queen's head and the cat purred only a slave restores a crown that has fallen and after a while the old queen woke and she looked about her and yawned then she said methought i dreamed and i saw four caterpillars chased by a scorpion around the trunk of an ancient oak tree i like not my dream then she closed her eyes and went to sleep again and she snored and the four slaves went on fanning her and the cat purred fan on fan on stupids you fan but the fire that consumes you End of the Lion's Daughter by Khalil Gibran. The Lost Ship from War Cargoes by William Wymark Jacobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. THE LOST SHIP by W. W. Jacobs On a fine spring morning in the early part of the present century, Tetby, a small port on the east coast, was keeping high holiday. Tradesmen left their shops and laborers their work, and flocked down to join the maritime element collected on the quay. In the usual way, Tetby was a quiet, dull little place, clustering in a tiny heap of town on one side of the river, and perching in scattered red-tiled cottages on the cliffs of the other. Now, however, people were grouped upon the stone quay, with its litter of fish-baskets and coils of rope, waiting expectantly, for today the largest ship ever built in Tetby, by Tetby hands, was to start upon her first voyage. As they waited, discussing past Tetby ships, their builders, their voyages, and their fate, a small piece of white sail showed on the noble bark from her moorings up the river. The groups on the quay grew quite animated as more sail was set, and in a slow and stately fashion the new ship drew near. As a light breeze took her sails, she came faster, sitting the water like a duck, her lofty masts tapering away to the sky as they broke through the white clouds of canvas. She passed within ten fathoms of the quay, and the men cheered, and the women held their children up to wave farewell, for she was manned from captain to cabin boy by Tetby men, and bound for the distant South Seas. Outside the harbor she altered her course somewhat, and bent, like a thing of life, to the wind blowing outside. The crew sprang into the rigging and waved their caps and kissed their grimy hands to receding Tetby. They were answered by rousing cheers from the shore, hoarse and masculine, to drown out the lachrymose attempts of the women. They watched her until their eyes were dim, and she was a mere white triangle speck on the horizon. Then, like a melting snowflake, 
she vanished into the air, and the Tetby folk, some envying the bold mariners, and others thankful that their lives were cast upon the safe and pleasant shore, slowly dispersed to their homes. Months passed, and the quiet routine of Tetby went on undisturbed. Other crafts came into port, and, discharging and loading, in an easy, comfortable fashion, sailed again. The keel of another ship was laid in the shipyard, and slowly the time came round when the return of Tetby's pride, for so she was named, might be reasonably looked for. It was feared that she might arrive in the night, the cold and cheerless night, when wives and children are abed, and even if roused to go down to the quay, would see no more of her than her sidelights staining the water, and her dark form stealing cautiously up the river. They would have her come by day, to see her first on the horizon, into which she had dipped and vanished, to see her come closer and closer, the good stout ship seasoned by southern seas and southern suns, with the crew crowding the sides to gaze at Tetby, and see how the children had grown. But she came not. Day after day the watchers waited for her in vain. It was whispered at length that she was overdue, and later on, but only by those who had neither kith nor kin aboard her, that she was missing. Long after all hope was gone, wives and mothers, after the manner of their kind, watched and waited on the cheerless quay. One by one they stayed away, and forgot the dead, to attend to the living. Babies grew into sturdy, ruddy-faced boys and girls, boys and girls into young men and women. But no news of the missing ship, no word from the missing men. Slowly year succeeded year, and the lost ship became a legend. The man who had built her was old and gray, and time had smoothed away the sorrows of the bereaved. It was on a dark, blustering September night that the old woman sat by her fire, knitting. The fire was low, for it was more for the sake of company than warmth, and it formed an agreeable contrast to the wind which was whistling around the house, bearing on its wings the sound of the waves as they came crashing ashore. "'God help those at sea to-night,' said the old woman devoutly, as a stronger gust than usual shook the house. She put her knitting in her lap and clasped her hands. At that moment the cottage door opened. The lamp flared and smoked up the chimney with the draft, and then went out. As the old woman rose from her seat, the door closed. "'Who's there?' she cried nervously. Her eyes were dim, and the darkness sudden, but she fancied she saw something standing by the door, and snatching a spill from the mantelpiece, she thrust it into the fire, and relit the lamp. A man stood on the threshold, a man of middle age with white, drawn face and scrubby beard. His clothes were in rags, and his hair unkempt, and his light gray eyes sunken and tired. The old woman looked at him and waited for him to speak. When he did so, he took a step towards her and said, Mother! With a great cry she threw herself upon his neck and strained him with her withered bosom and kissed him. She could not believe her eyes, her senses, but clasped him convulsively, and bade him speak again, and wept, and thanked God, and laughed all in a breath. Then she remembered herself, and led him tottering to the old Windsor chair, thrust him in it, and, quivering with excitement, took food and drink from the cupboard, and placed before him. He ate hungrily, the old woman watching him, and standing by his side, to keep his glass filled with the home-brewed beer. At times he would have spoken, but she motioned him to silence and bade him eat, the tears coursing down her aged cheeks as she looked at his white, famished face. At length he laid down his knife and fork and drank off the ale, intimating that he had finished. "'My boy, my boy,' said the old woman in a broken voice, "'I thought you were gone down with the Tetby's pride long years ago.' He shook his head heavily. "'The captain and crew and the good ship?' asked the mother. Where are they? Captain and crew, said the son, in a strange, hesitating fashion. It's a long story. The ale has made me heavy. They are... He left off abruptly and closed his eyes. Where are they? asked his mother. What happened? 
he opened his eyes slowly. I am tired, dead tired. I have not slept. I'll, I'll tell you morning. He nodded again, and the old woman shook him gently. Go to bed, then, your old bed, Jim. It's as you left it, and it's made with the sheets aired. It's been ready for you ever since. He rose to his feet and stood swaying to and fro. His mother opened a door in the wall, and taking a lamp, lighted him up the steep wooden staircase to the room he knew so well. Then he took her in his arms, in a feeble hug and kissing her on the forehead sat down wearily on the bed. The old woman returned to her kitchen, and falling upon her knees, remained for some time in a state of graceful, pious ecstasy. When she arose she thought of those other women, and snatching a shawl from its peg behind the door, ran up the deserted street with her tidings. In a very short time the town was astir. Like a breath of hope the whisper flew from house to house. Doors closed for the night were thrown open, and wandering children questioning their weeping mothers. Blurred images of husbands and fathers long since given over for dead stood out clearly and distinctly, smiling with bright faces on their dear ones. At the cottage door two or three people had already collected, and others were coming up the street in an unwanted bustle. They found their way barred by an old woman, a resolute old woman, her face still working with the great joy which had come into her old life, but who refused them admittance until her son had slept. Their thirst for news was uncontrollable, but with a swelling in her throat she realized that her share in Tetby's pride was safe. Women who had been waiting, and got patient at last after years of waitings, could not endure these additional few hours. Despair was endurable, but suspense. Oh, God! Was their man alive? What did he look like? Had he aged much? He is so fatigued he could scarcely speak, she said. She had questioned him, but he was unable to reply. Give him but till the dawn, and they should know all. So they waited, for to go home and sleep was impossible. Occasionally they moved a little way up the street, but never very far, and gathered in small knots, excitedly discussing the great event. It came to be understood that the rest of the crew had been cast away on an uninhabited island. It could be nothing else, and would doubtless soon be with them, all except one or two, perhaps, who were old men when the ship sailed, and had probably died in the meantime. One said this in the hearing of an old woman whose husband, if alive, would be in extreme old age, but she smiled peacefully, albeit her lip trembling, and said she only expected to hear of him. That was all. The suspense became almost unendurable. Would this man never wake? Would it never be dawn? The children were chilled with the wind, but their elders could scarcely have felt an arctic frost. With growing impatience they waited, glancing at times at two women who held themselves somewhat aloof from the others, two women who had married again, and whose second husbands waited, awkwardly enough, with them. Slowly the weary, windy night wore away, the old woman, deaf to their appeals, still keeping her door fast. The dawn was not yet, though the oft-consulted watches announced it near at hand. It was very close now, and the watchers collected by the door. It was undeniable that things were seen a little more distinctly. One could see better the grey, eager faces of his neighbours. They knocked upon the door, and the old woman's eyes filled as she opened it and saw those faces. Unasked and unchided, they invaded the cottage and crowded round the door. "'I will go up and fetch him,' said the old woman. If each could hear the beating of the other's hearts, the noise would have been deafening. But as it was, there was complete silence, except for some overwrought woman's sob. The old woman opened the door leading to the room above and with the slow, deliberate steps of age ascended the stairs, and those below heard her calling softly to her son. Two or three minutes passed, and she was heard descending the stairs again, alone. The smile, the pity, had left her face, and she seemed dazed and strange. 
I cannot wake him, she said piteously. He sleeps so sound. He was fatigued. I have shaken him, but he still sleeps. As she stopped and looked appealingly round, the other old woman took her hand, and pressing it, led her to a chair. Two of the men sprang quickly up the stairs. They were absent for a short while, and then they came down like men bewildered and distraught. No need to speak. A low wail of utter misery rose from the woman, and was caught up and repeated by the crowd outside, for the only man who could have set their hearts at rest had escaped the perils of the deep, and died quietly in his bed. End of the Lost Ship by W. W. Jacobs Men I'm Not Married To by Dorothy Parker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Tony Addison Men I'm Not Married To No matter where my route may lie, no matter whither I repair, in brief, no matter how or why or when I go, the boys are there. On lane and byways, street and square, on alley path and avenue, they seem to spring up everywhere. The men I am not married to. I watch them as they pass me by, at each in wonderment I stare, and, but for heaven's grace, I cry, there goes the guy whose name I'd wear. They represent no species rare, they walk and talk as others do, their fair to see, but only fair, the men I am not married to. I'm sure that to a mother's eye is each potentially a bear, but though at home they rank ace high, no change of heart could I declare, yet worry silvers not their hair, they deck them not with sprigs of rue. It's curious how they do not care. The men I am not married to. L'envoi. In fact, if they'd a chance to share their lot with me a lifetime through, they'd doubtless tender me the air. The men I am not married to. Freddy. Oh, boy, people say of Freddy. You just ought to meet him sometime. He's a riot, that's what he is. More fun than a goat. Other and more imaginative souls play whimsically with the idea and say that he is more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Still others go at the thing from a different angle and refer to him as being as funny as a crutch. But I always feel myself that they stole the line from Freddy. Satire, that is his dish. And there you have, really, one of Freddy's great crosses. People steal his stuff right and left. He will say something one day, and the next it will be as good as all over the city. Time after time I have gone to him, and told him that I have heard lots of vaudeville acts using his comedy, but he just puts on the most killing expression, and says, Oh, say not suchly, in that way of his. And, of course, it gets me laughing, so that I can't say another word about it. That is the way he always is, just laughing it off 
when he is told that people are using his best lines without even so much as a word of acknowledgment. I never hear anyone say, there is such a thing as being too good-natured, but that I think of Freddy. You never knew anyone like him on a party. Things will be dragging along the way they do at the beginning of the evening, with the early arrivals sitting around asking one another, have they been to anything good at the theatre lately, and is it any wonder there is so much sickness around with the weather so changeable? The party will be just about plucking at the coverlet, when in will breeze Freddy, and from that moment on the evening is little short of a whirlwind. Often and often I have heard him called the life of the party, and I have always felt that there is not the least bit of exaggeration in the expression. What I envy about Freddy is that poise of his. He can come right into a room full of strangers and be just as much at home as if he had gone through grammar school with them. He smashes the ice all to nothing the moment he is introduced to the other guests by pretending to misunderstand their names and calling them something entirely different, and keeping a perfectly straight face all the time as if he never realised there was anything wrong. A great many people say he puts them in mind of Buster Keaton that way. He is never at a loss for a, a screaming crack. If the hostess asks him to have a chair, Freddy comes right back at her with, No thanks, we have chairs at home. <laughs> if the host offers him a cigar, he will say, Just like a flash, What's the matter with it? If one of the men borrows a cigarette and a light from him, Freddy will say in that dry voice of his, Do you want the coupons too? Of course, his wit is pretty fairly caustic, but no one ever seems to take offence at it. I suppose there is everything in the way he says things. And he is practically a whole vaudeville show in himself. He is never without a new story of what Pat said to Mike as they were walking down the street, or how A.B. tried to cheat Ike, or what old Aunt Jemima answered when she was asked why she had married for the fifth time. Uh, Freddy does them in dialect, and I have often thought it is a wonder that we don't all split our sides, and never a selection that every member of the family couldn't listen to either. Just healthy fun. Then he has a repertory of song numbers, too. He gives them without accompaniment, and every song has a virtually unlimited number of verses, after each one of which Freddy goes conscientiously through the chorus. There is one awfully clever one, a big favourite of his, with the chorus rendered a different way each time, showing how they sang it when Grandma was a girl, how they sing it in Gay Paris, and how a cabaret performer would do it. Then there are several along the general lines of Casey Jones, two or three about Negroes, who specialised on the banjo, and a few in which the lyric of the chorus consists of the syllables, <laughs> The idea is that the audience will get laughing along with the singer. If there is a piano in the house, Freddy can tear things even wider open. There may be many more accomplished musicians, but nobody can touch him as far as being ready to oblige goes. There is never any of this hanging back, waiting to be coaxed, or protesting that he hasn't touched a key in months. He just sits right down and does all his specialities for you. He is particularly good at doing Dixie with one hand, and Home, Sweet Home, with the other, and Joseph Hoffman himself can't tie Freddy when it comes to giving an imitation of a fife and drum corps approaching, passing, and fading away in the distance. 
but it is when the refreshments are served that freddy reaches the top of his form he always insists on helping to pass plates and glasses and when he gets a big armful of them he pretends to stumble it is as good as a play to see the hostess face then he tucks his napkin into his collar and sits there just as solemnly as if he thought that were the thing to do or perhaps he will vary that one by folding the napkin into a little square and putting it carefully in his pocket as if he thought it was a handkerchief oh you just ought to see him making believe that he has swallowed an olive pit and the remarks he makes about the food i do wish i could remember how they go he is funniest though it seems to me when he is pretending that the lemonade is intoxicating and that he feels its effects pretty strongly <laughs> when you have seen him do this it will be small surprise to you that freddy is in such demand for social functions but freddy is not one of those humorists who perform only when out in society all day long he is bubbling over with fun and the beauty of it is that he is not a mere theorist as a joker a practical that's freddy all over if he isn't sending long telegrams collected to his friends then he is sending them packages of useless groceries c o d a telephone is just so much meat to him i don't believe any one will ever know how much fun freddy and his friends get out of freddy's calling them up and making them guess who he is when he really wants to extend himself he calls up in the middle of the night and says that he is the wire tester he uses that one only on special occasions though it is pretty elaborate for everyday use but day in and day out you can depend upon it that he is putting over some uproarious trick with a dribbled glass or a loaded cigar or a pencil with a rubber point and you can feel completely sure that no matter where he is or how unexpectedly you may come upon him freddy will be right there with a funny line or a comparatively new story for you that is what people marvel over when they are talking about him how he is always <laughs> just the same it is right there really that they put their finger on the big trouble with him but you just ought to meet freddy sometime he's a riot that's what he is more fun than a circus mortimer mortimer had his photograph taken in his dress suit raymond so long as you keep him well in land raymond will never give you trouble but when he gets down to the seashore he affects a bathing suit fitted with little sleeves on wading into the sea ankle deep he leans over and carefully applies handfuls of water to his wrists and forehead charlie it's curious but no one seems to be able to recall what charlie used to talk about before the country went what may be called with screaming effect dry of course there must have been a lot of unsatisfactory weather even then and i don't doubt that he slipped in a word or two when the talk got around to the insanity of the then current styles of women's dress but though i have taken up the thing in a serious way and have gone about among his friends making inquiries i cannot seem to find that he could ever have got any farther than that in the line of conversation in fact he must have been one of those strong silent men in the old days those who have not seen him for several years would be in a position to be knocked flat with a feather if they could see what a regular little chatterbox charlie has become say what you will about prohibition and who has a better right you would have to admit if you knew charlie 
that it has been the making of him as a conversationalist. He never requires his audience to do any feeding for him. It needs no careful leading around of the subject, no tactful questions, no well-timed allusions to get him nicely loosened up. All you have to do is say good evening to him, ask him how everybody over at his house is getting along, and give him a chair, though this last is not essential, and silver-tongued Charlie is good for three hours straight on where he is getting it, how much he has to pay for it, and what the chances are of his getting hold of a couple of cases of genuine pinch-bottle along around the middle of next week. I have known him to hold entire dinner parties spellbound from cocktails to finger bowls with his monologue. Now I would be well down among the last when it comes to wanting to give you the impression that Charlie has been picked for the all-American alcoholic team. Despite the wetness of his conversation, he is just a nice, normal, conscientious drinker willing to take it or let it alone in the order named. I don't say he would not be able to get along without it, but neither do I say that he doesn't get along perfectly splendidly with it. I don't think I ever saw anyone who could get as much fun as Charlie can out of splitting the Eighteenth Amendment with a friend. There is a glamour of vicarious romance about him, you gather from his conversation that he comes into daily contact with any number of picturesque people. He tells about a friend of his who owns three untouched bottles of the last absinthe to come into the country, or a lawyer he knows, one of whose grateful clients sent him six cases of champagne in addition to his fee, or a man he met who had to move to the country in order to have room for his scotch. Charlie has no end of anecdotes about the interesting women he meets, too. There is one girl he often dwells on, who, if you only give her time, can get you little bottles of chartreuse, each containing an individual drink. Another gifted young woman friend of his is the inventor of a cocktail in which you mix a spoonful of orange marmalade. Yet another is the justly proud owner of a pet marmoset, which becomes the prince of good fellows as soon as you have fed him a couple of teaspoonfuls of gin. It is the next best thing to knowing these people yourself, to hear Charlie tell about them. He just makes them live. It is wonderful how Charlie's circle of acquaintances has widened during the last two years, there is nothing so broadening as prohibition. Among his new friends, he numbers a conductor on a train that runs down from Montreal, and a young man who owns his own truck, and a group of chaps who work in drug stores, and I don't know how many proprietors of homey little restaurants in the basements of brownstone houses. Some of them have turned out to be but fair-weather friends, unfortunately. There was one young man, whom Charlie had looked upon practically as a brother, who went particularly bad on him. It seems he had taken a pretty solemn oath to supply Charlie as a personal favour with a case of real Gordon, which he said he was able to get through his high social connections on the other side. When what the young man called a nominal sum was paid, and the case was delivered. Its bottles were found to contain a nameless liquor, though those of Charlie's friends who gave it a fair trial suggested Storm King as a good name for the brand. Charlie has never laid eyes on the young man from that day to this. He is still unable to talk about it without a break in his voice. As he says, and quite rightly, too. It was the principle of the thing. But for the most part, his new friends are just the truest pals a man ever had. In more time than it takes to tell it, 
Charlie will keep you right abreast with them, sketch in for you how they are, and what they are doing, and what their last words to him were. But Charlie can be the best of listeners, too. Just tell him about any little formula you may have picked up for making it at home, and you will find the most sympathetic of audiences, and one who will even go to the flattering length of taking notes on your discourse. Relate to him tales of unusual places where you have heard that you can get it, or of grotesque sums that you have been told have been exchanged for it, and he will hang on to your every word, leading you on, asking intelligent questions, encouraging you by references to like experiences of his own. But don't let yourself get carried away with success, and attempt to branch out into other topics, for you will lose Charlie in a minute if you try it. But that, now I think of it, would probably be the very idea you would have in mind. Lloyd Lloyd wears washable neckties. Henry, you would really be surprised at the number of things that Henry knows just a shade more about than anybody else does. Naturally, he can't help realizing this about himself. But you mustn't think for a minute that he has let it spoil him. On the contrary, as the French so well put it, he has no end of patience with others, and he is always willing to oversee what they are doing and to offer them counsel. When it comes to giving his time and his energy, there is nobody who could not admit that Henry is generous to a fault i have even heard people go so far as to say if for instance henry happens to drop in while four of his friends are struggling along through a game of bridge he does not cut in and take a hand thereby showing up their playing in comparison to his no henry draws up a chair and sits looking on with a kindly smile of course now and then he cannot restrain a look of pain or an exclamation of surprise, or even a burst of laughter, as he listens to the bidding, but he never interferes. Frequently, after a card has been played, he will lean over and, in a good-humoured way, tell the player what he should have done instead, and how he might just as well throw his hand down then and there, but he always refuses to take any more active part in the game. Occasionally, when a uniquely poisonous play is made, I have seen Henry thrust his chair aside and pace about in speechless excitement, but for the most part he is admirably self-controlled. He always leaves, with a few cheery words to the players, urging them to keep at it and not let themselves get discouraged. And that is the way Henry is about everything. He will stroll over to a tennis court and stand on the sidelines at what I am sure must be great personal inconvenience, calling words of advice and suggestion for sets at a stretch. I have even known him to follow his friends all the way around a golf course, offering constructive criticism on their form as he goes. I tell you, in this day and generation, you don't find many people who will go as far out of their way for their friends as Henry does and I am far from being the only one who says so too. I have often thought that Henry must be the boy who got up the idea of leaving the world a little better than he found it. Yet he never crashes in on his friend's affairs. Only after the thing is done does he point out to you how it could have been done just a dash better. After you have signed the lease for the new apartment, Henry tells you where you could have got one cheaper and sunnier. After you are all tied up with the new firm, Henry explains to you where you made your big mistake in leaving the old one. It is never any news to me when I hear people telling Henry that he knows more about more things than anybody they ever saw in their lives. And I don't remember ever having heard Henry and give them any argument on that one. 
Joe. After Joe had had two cocktails, he wanted to go up and bat for the trap drummer. After he had had three, he began to get personal about the unattractive shade of the necktie worn by the strange man at the next table. Oliver. Oliver had a way of dragging his mouth to one side by means of an inserted forefinger, explaining to you, meanwhile, in necessarily obscure tones, the work which his dentist had just accomplished on his generously displayed back teeth. Albert. Albert sprinkled powdered sugar on his sliced tomatoes. End of Men I'm Not Married To by Dorothy Parker The Minions of Midas by Jack London This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman The Minions of Midas from Moonface and Other Stories by Jack London Wade Ashler is dead. Dead by his own hand. To say that this was entirely unexpected by the small cadre which knew him would be to say an untruth, and yet never once had we, his intimates, ever canvassed the idea. Rather had we been prepared for it in some incomprehensibly subconscious way. Before the perpetration of the deed, its possibility is remotest from our thoughts. But when we did know that he was dead, it seemed, somehow, that we had understood and looked forward to it all the time. This, by retrospective analysis, we could easily explain by the fact of his great trouble. I use great trouble advisedly. Young, handsome, with an assured position as the right-hand man of Eben Hale, the great street railway magnate, there was no reason for him to complain of fortune's favors. And yet we had watched his smooth brow furrow and corrugate, as under some canking care or devouring sorrow, we had watched his thick black hair thin and silver, as green grain under brazen skies and parching drought. Who can forget, in the midst of the hilarious scenes he toward the last sought with greater and greater avidity? Who can forget, I say, the deep abstractions and black moods into which he fell? At such times, when the fun rippled and soared from height to height, suddenly, without rhyme or reason, his eyes would turn lackluster, his brows knit, as with clenched hands and face overshot with spasms of mental pain, he wrestled on the edge of the abyss with some unknown danger. He never spoke of his troubles, nor were we indiscreet enough to ask. But it was just as well, for had we, and had he spoken, our help and strength would have availed nothing. When Eben Hale died, whose confidential secretary he was, nay, well-nigh adopted son and full business partner, he no longer came among us, not as I now know that our company was distasteful to him, but because his troubles had so grown that he could not respond to our happiness nor find surcease with us. Why this should be so we could not at the time understand, for when Eben Hale's will was probated, the world learned that he was sole heir to his employer's many millions, and it was expressly stipulated that this great inheritance was given to him without qualification, hitch, or hindrance in the exercise thereof. Not a share of stock, not a penny of cash, was bequested to the dead man's relatives. As for his direct family, one astounding clause expressly stated that Wade Ashler was to dispense to Eben Hale's wife and sons and daughters whatever money his judgment dictated, at whatever time he deemed advisable. Had there been any scandal in the dead man's family, or had his sons been wild or undutiful, then there might have been a glimmering of reason for this most unusual action. But Eben Hale's domestic happiness had been proverbial in the community and one would have to travel far and wide to discover a cleaner, saner, wholesomer progeny of sons and daughters, while his wife, well, for those who knew her best, she was endearingly turned, the mother of the Graki, nevertheless to state 
This inexorable will was a nine days' wonder. But the expectant public was disappointed in that no contest was made. It was only the other day that even Hale was laid away in his stately marble mausoleum, and now Wade Ashler is dead. The news was printed in the morning's paper. I have just received through the mail a letter from him, posted evidently but a short hour before he hurled himself into eternity. This letter, which lies before me, is a narrative in his own handwriting, linking together numerous newspaper clippings and facsimiles of letters. The original correspondence, he has told me, is in the hands of the police. He has begged me also, as a warning to society against the most frightful and diabolical danger which threatens its very existence, to make public the terrible series of tragedies in which he has been innocently concerned. I hear with a pen the text in full. It was August 1899, just after my return from my summer vacation, when the blow fell. We did not know it at the time. We had not yet learned to school our minds to such awful possibilities. Mr. Hale opened the letter, read it, and tossed it on my desk with a laugh. When I had looked it over, I also laughed, saying, Some ghastly joke, Mr. Hale, and one in very poor taste. Find here, my dear John, an exact duplicate of the letter in question. Office of the M&M, &M, August 17, 1899 Mr. Eben Hale, Money Baron. Dear Sir, We desire you to realize upon whatever portion of your vast holdings is necessary to obtain in cash twenty millions of dollars. This sum we require you to pay over to us, or to our agents. You will note that we do not specify any given time, for it is not our wish to hurry you in this matter. You may even, if it is easier for you, pay us in ten, fifteen, or twenty installments, but we will accept no single installment of less than a million. Believe us, dear Mr. Hale, when we say that we have embarked upon this course of action utterly devoid of animus. We are members of the intellectual proletariat, the increasing numbers of which mark in red lettering the last day of the nineteenth century. We have, from a thorough study of economics, decided to enter upon this business. It has many merits chief among which may be noted that we can indulge in large and lucrative operations without capital. So far, we have been fairly successful, and we hope our dealings with you may be pleasant and satisfactory. Pay attention while we explain our views more fully. At the base of the present system of society is to be found the property right, and this right of an individual to hold property is demonstrated in the last analysis the rest solely and wholly upon might. The male gentlemen of William the Conqueror divided and apportioned England amongst themselves with the naked sword. This, we are sure you will grant, is true of all feudal possessions. With the invention of steam and the industrial revolution, there came into existence the capitalist class, in the modern sense of the word. These capitalists quickly towered above the ancient nobility, the captains of industry have virtually dispossessed the descendants of the captains of war. Mind, not muscle, wins in today's struggle for existence. But this state of affairs is nonetheless based upon might. The change has been qualitative. The old-time feudal baronage ravaged the world with fire and sword. The modern money baronage exploits the world by mastering and applying the world's economic forces. Brain, not brawn, endures and those best fitted to survive are the intellectually and commercially powerful. We, the M of M, are not content to become wage slaves. The great trusts and business combines, with which you have your rating, prevent us from rising to the place among you, which our intellects qualify us to occupy. Why? Because we are without capital. We are of the unwashed, but with this difference. Our brains are the best and we have no foolish ethical or social scruples. As wage slaves, toiling early and late, and living abstemiously, we could not save in threescore years, nor in twenty times threescore years, a sum of money sufficiently successful to cope with the great aggregations of massed capital which now exist. Nevertheless, we have entered the arena. 
we now throw down the gauge to the capital of the world. Whether or not it wishes to fight or not, it shall have to fight. Mr. Hale, our interests dictate us to demand of you twenty millions of dollars. While we are considerate enough to give you reasonable time in which to carry out your share of the transaction, please do not delay too long. When you have agreed to our terms, insert a suitable notice in the agony column of the morning blazer. We shall then acquaint you with our plans to transfer the sum mentioned. You had better do this some time prior to October 1st. If you do not, in order to show that we are in earnest, we shall on that date kill a man on East 39th Street. He will be a working man. This man you do not know, nor do we. You represent a force in modern society. We also represent a force, a new force. Without anger or malice, we have closed in battle. As you will readily discern, we are simply a business proposition. You are the upper, and we the nether millstone. This man's life shall be ground out between. You may save him if you agree to our conditions, and act in time. There was once a king cursed with a golden touch. His name we have taken to do duty as our official seal. Some day, to protect ourselves against competitors, we shall copyright it. Beg to remain, the minions of Midas. I leave it to you, dear John. Why should we not have laughed over such a preposterous communication? The idea, we could not but grant, was well conceived, but it was too grotesque to be taken seriously.